Hello, and we're back again at the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society with author Stephen Koss, author of The Fever of 1721, The Epidemic That Revolutionized Medicine and American Politics. Uh, I'm also joined today by my colleague, uh, historian Christian Despigna, author of The Founding Martyr, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, the American Revolution's lost hero. So Stephen, previously we uh, covered some of the issues and, and, and we've noticed that in your book you have a lot of interwoven stories. Um, Christian, why don't we uh, begin this session with a very important issue that, uh, that you've identified in his book as well. Yeah, Steve, so, so the issue of race is always an undercurrent, undercurrent in your story. Uh, it's not a primary theme, but it, it's always there just beneath the surface. So you said that to understand the reaction to inoculation, we need to understand the racial tension that existed in Boston in 1721. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I think certainly in terms of um, understanding what happened in Boston in 1721 relative to inoculation, it's, it's essential to understand the racial tension that existed. Um, in, in funny, funny enough, it wasn't something that I really recognized while I was writing the book. It was only afterwards that I realized that in so many ways, um, African slaves were um, uh, catalysts, if you will, for what happened. So, for example, um, the first case of smallpox that anyone identified in Boston, the, the, the uh, patient zero, I guess you would call him, was an African slave of a sea captain named Paxton. And, and apparently what happened was he had, uh, the slave had rowed Paxton's son out to a ship called the Seahorse, which had brought uh, smallpox in from Barbados. And while, the, while he was there on the ship, he visited with some other, uh, some people on the ship that he knew, contracted smallpox and came back and he became, so he became, at least he was blamed. And, and at that's my point. He was blamed for being the cause, if you will, of the smallpox epidemic, the first patient. Now he was well treated by the town and by his master in terms of medical care. Um, so th there was not any kind of direct, um, uh, you know, nothing was taken out on him in a direct kind of way, but it, it didn't go unnoticed, I'm sure, that this, this dread disease had come back to Boston after all this time, and it was, as far as the white people were concerned, it was a black man who had, who had brought it. Um, and then you have uh, Onesimus, who was Cotton Mather's slave, uh, had been for quite a while at that point, who at some point in the relationship had told Mather that before he had been abducted and shipped to, to uh, North America, he had been inoculated and that it was a common occurrence in uh, the villages in his part of Africa, that when smallpox came to the village, they would find someone who had, a, had the disease, essentially harvest a little bit of the pus from a smallpox pustule, implant it in an incision or several incisions in the body of a healthy person, and that person would uh, get a little sick, but, but acquire immunity, lifelong immunity. So when, you know, the Cotton Mather found that out at some point, point between like 1716 and 1721. We don't know exactly when the conversation happened, uh, but, but Mather knew about it. And he seems to have been the only white person in Boston who knew about it, which is pretty amazing when you think that although there weren't a lot of slaves by, by comparison to some other colonies, there were probably um, somewhere on the order of, I don't know, 500 to 1,000 maybe, um, probably on the lower end. But there were plenty of Plenty of people from Africa who had had who had this kind of telltale um, scar, and only Mather thought to ask about it. But when Mather did come forward with this in 1721, this knowledge about inoculation, he said he, he admitted that he had learned it from his African slave, and that he had it was also corroborated by something that he'd read in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Uh, coincidentally in the same issue that published his first contribution. So he, he had been awaiting this, this uh, issue to see his own words in print and found them, although very, very truncated from what he hoped they would be. Uh, like many authors, he was, he was edited heavily. 
But he, he immediately after that, he saw a story in this or an account in the philosophical transactions of inoculation um, in, I think it was Turkey. Um, so Mather had these two stories of Onesimus and the, and the philosophical transaction story. But in 1721, he didn't, he didn't leave the Onesimus part behind and just talk about what would have been considered a more uh, reputable source. He, just, he, he mentioned, he said his slave had it and that there were other men in Boston from Africa, uh, women too, who'd had it. And um, so that became, not, not only now did, did smallpox come from, quote unquote, come from an African, but now there was an African recommending that smallpox uh, could be cured or prevented rather by inoculation. And when you take this in the context of the fact that several years earlier, there had been the first, I think, major violent slave uprising in the colony of New York um, that had repercussions that went far beyond the, the size of the tragedy. I think, I want to say so about 10 white masters had been murdered. The slaves who staged the revolt, uh, I think, ended up committing suicide rather than be captured. Um, but in, in, in vengeance over the, the audacity of this act, uh, the white people in New York rounded up approximately, I think it was 30 to 50 Africans who, who had no real association with this, certainly hadn't participated in it, and, um, and punished and killed a number of them. And that, that story, although this was several years later, I think that was still in everybody's mind. So when inoculation got recommended, one of the ways that it was um, argued against, and by, by very credible people like Dr. William Douglas, who was one of the, one of the doctors in town and was the only doctor with an MD uh, in, Amer in, uh, well, in Boston for sure, probably in, in all of New England. What he argued was, among other people, that this was, first of all, that these were slaves. They were quote unquote ignorant and they were, you know, this was, this was nonsense to even consider what they would say seriously. But also people said this might be an attempt uh, like New York at slaves trying to stage an uprising. So, you know, the, the people who bore the brunt of the actual pushback against inoculation were the doctor who performed it, uh, Zabdiel Boylston and Cotton Mather. Uh, Mather's house was firebombed. Boylston had to hide for several weeks because he was uh, in danger of being lynched. His uh, property was vandalized. He, he suffered insults on the street, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But really, sort of the underlying impetus for a lot of the pushback against inoculation, and also the reason Mather even had the corroboration to know to recommend it, had to do with with an African in, in the midst in their midst in Boston and. And so, uh, you know, it's interesting because when I, I started out and I knew about Onesimus and I, I, one of my chapters is called Onesimus because I wanted to make sure he got his due. And unfortunately, there's very little we know about him beyond 1721. So I knew that and I wanted to give him his due, but I didn't really give full appreciation to how much fear of uh, a slave uprising and a growing population of Africans in Boston had uh what a big part it had in the story yeah you know and i just wanted to just quickly follow up on that i know you said that uh, i think there were three or four inoculations that boylston had initially performed and two of them were on slaves it was on one a, a slave and the slave's son if i'm not mistaken if i Correct. remember correctly yeah thank you for reminding me of that because that's another that's another aspect i mean when boylston did his initial experiment he inoculated mm -hmm. three people his own son, the six-year-old son, Thomas, uh, his adult slave, Jack, and Jackie's, uh, Jack's son, Jackie, who then was like three years old. Right. And I think those, were, those three subjects were very carefully chosen by him. And, and obviously, I think he realized from the outset this was a somewhat outlandish thing he was proposing to give somebody smallpox, albeit in a different fashion. Right. Intentionally. To, intentionally. Right. Mm -hmm. To implant smallpox in their body in order to save them from smallpox. It, it was very counterintuitive. It seemed absurd. Boylston believed it would work, but I think he very carefully picked his first three subjects. One, one being his son. In other words, right. I have enough confidence in this to perform it on one of my own. And, and, and then for several reasons, two of his slaves. And I think 
there are probably three reasons altogether. One was um, mercenary, to be honest with you. I mean, I, this was his property. He wanted to protect his property. Right. Um, also, there's evidence to believe that Jack was uh, served as Boylston's medical assistant, uh, especially when he didn't have an apprentice uh, attached to him. So I think he also wanted Jack healthy so that Jack could help him inoculate other people and deal with patients throughout the smallpox epidemic. But the last reason, and I think this is no small, small thing, but I didn't realize it when I was writing, is that I think he wanted to have a, a, a black person be a recipient of inoculation as a way of anticipating and trying to preempt this suspicion that uh, Africans, this was an African plot. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Well, we talked briefly, you mentioned uh, Benjamin Franklin previously in our, our previous discussion, and a lot of people don't realize that Franklin was originally from Boston. And in your book, you have him as a very young man, age 15 to 17, and you make an argument that in, in a sense, this was a key development of his life. Now, why is this period so important in developing the, the maturity for Franklin? Yeah, I mean, I, I, when I first came upon this story, I knew about the inoculation aspect of it. Um, I knew about, then I learned more about Mather's involvement in it. And then I learned about the Franklins, not just Benjamin, but Benjamin and his brother James, who all people know about James Franklin is what they read from Benjamin's autobiography, which is that he beat Benjamin. He was, he was Benjamin's master. Benjamin was his uh, printing apprentice. And as Benjamin tells it, he, he was tough, a, tough, a tough master. And he was, so I don't want to change that. But what Franklin doesn't give James credit for is the fact that his, uh, Benjamin's apprenticeship with James Franklin, which went from about uh, 1718 until 1724, supposed to go much longer, Ben skipped out of town. It was really the, uh, the catalyst for Benjamin Franklin becoming who he was. Um, you know, I say as part, partly in fun, everything Ben Franklin ever really needed to know, he learned in 1721, or certainly in that period leading up to 1721. The reason is, the reason I say that is when Franklin, the reason Franklin and James were, were put together was that Ben had been working as a, an apprentice to his father in the tallow shop, and he hated it. And he talks about this in the autobiography. And he was getting very discouraged, and his father was worried that he was going to lose his spirit, or even worse, he was going to hop a ship and head out to sea because he had aspirations to become a sailor. And so, uh, coincidentally, James wanted to start a printing shop. His father said, okay, I will give you the money. Uh, I'll find the money to give you. Uh, on one condition, and the condition was Benjamin Franklin would have to be his apprentice. And at this point, the brothers didn't know each other very well because James had been away in London studying or, or learning to be a, a printer. And, and Ben was a young, young boy, 12 years old, when they came together. But coming from this, you know, having been pulled out of school at age 10, which was demoralizing for Franklin, and then having been put in this job that was not stimulating to a man of his genius, the brain power that he had. And then to come to a printing house, which had a library with real books, and which had James Franklin, you know, was, a, was himself a very intelligent, uh, intellectual person. He had a group of friends who liked to talk about books and liked to talk about politics and liked to talk about uh, social issues of the time and literature. And this this was the environment that Benjamin Franklin found himself in every single day from 1718 through this period I'm writing about, 1721. And he learned, not only did he learn to, this is also not coincidentally when his fabled self-education began. And as he had the opportunity to move out of his family's house and, and take a residence with a, a, another family, he, um, he used all his spare time to, to read, even at the expense of going to church. And he would get to the printing house early and he would stay late. And he, uh, he took all his, he got James to um, give him the money that James would spend feeding him, because as the master, James was responsible for his meals, give him that money. And, and Benjamin basically used half of it for food and took the other half of it and used it for books and started buying books at this young age scraping his pennies together to do it. 
So this was, you can get a sense of kind of the intellectual energy that was building around Franklin. And if this had not happened, if he hadn't gone to his brother's printing shop, if he hadn't met the other men in this shop, if he hadn't been gotten involved with the New England Current, which was the newspaper James started publishing, and which Ben eventually contributed to as Silence Do Good. Um, if this hadn't happened, um, it's hard to imagine that Ben Franklin would have been the Ben Franklin that we know. Um, and also, even in terms of medicine, you know, Ben Franklin had a ringside seat to this inoculation experiment. And not only was it one of the most important experiments in Western medicine, it was, also an ex it was also an example of a man who, like Benjamin, came from humble beginnings, Zabdiel Boylston, the doctor who performed the experiment, grew up on the outskirts of Boston, did not come from a family that had uh, a pedigree, did not come from a family that had money. Um, he, basically, he was not considered one of the preeminent doctors in Boston when he performed the inoculations. And so Benjamin, I think, saw in Boylston uh, well, wow, this guy became a member, a fellow of the Royal Society. And um, this was what Benjamin aspired to as well and eventually, uh, 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 you know, succeeded at becoming. So all of these things came together. And, th and then the last thing I'll say is just that James Franklin is a fascinating character. In a way, he's my favorite character in the book. But one thing he was really bad about was he, he could not compromise. He had a hot temper. Um, he had very high standards, and he he was he could not compromise. And Ben Franklin, I think, really by nature was more like James than people realize. He was more pugnacious. He was more argumentative. He admits to having been argumentative, um, to be having been too saucy for his own good was how he put it. But what he learned from James's ultimate failure, because James published this amazing newspaper you know, managed to, to walk the line between the censors and not being censored, and then finally pushed it too far because he was James Franklin and couldn't avoid it, and then got thrown in jail twice, uh, when, and Benjamin had to take over his paper. But I think Ben learned that sometimes the best way to succeed was not by winning the argument or not by pushing the argument. And so the great diplomat that Benjamin Franklin became and that we, we celebrate him for, and that had played such a huge role in the American Revolution, that came in, a part, in part two from having gone through this experience of seeing how you can't argue, argue your way through everything. You have to find ways to charm people. And there are, there, there are lots of examples of Franklin both being very angry, but then you know, manifesting that anger in a much more acceptable way that ends up winning the day. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So, Steve, Historians are always being asked to discuss the relevance of their work to today's political and societal challenges. Obviously, you write about the smallpox epidemic in 1721, which has an obvious parallel with the COVID-19. But is there another aspect to the story you find particularly re relevant? Yeah, I mean, everything's kind of tied into the smallpox story, or in our case, the COVID story. But I think as you're seeing now, and unfortunately, just, you know, as we speak, there, um, when there's a, a health crisis of this magnitude, when there's an emergency in society, um, it doesn't just affect the health of the people. It affects the politics of the time. Uh, it affects the economics of the time. It affects the social fabric of the community. Um, and it's, you know, the thing about it is, I, at least from my book, and I suspect now as well, a lot of wonderful things can come out of that, that tension, um, the need to come up with a new cure, um, you know, new ways of, of speaking out, new ways of, uh, of asserting oneself. Um, the, the New England Current was the first independent newspaper in America, meaning that they didn't ask for or claim to be um, sponsored by the government, which until that point was the role of the newspaper to just manifest the government's uh, you know, policies. Um, you, I, I don't know that, you, well, I know that James Franklin wouldn't have started the paper without the smallpox epidemic because he used the epidemic to generate enough interest to start a newspaper. But those are the good kind of things that happen. Unfortunately, there's also, you know, a lot of the political tension I write about um, and, you know, it was pretty severe. It was to a point where people were saying that England was going to take away uh, Ma the Massachusetts Charter 
and impose, essentially impose martial law and certainly a more strict oversight from parliament. You know, at this point, Boston had a royal governor imposed upon it, but it still had its own government and its government had the power to pay the royal governor. So they had some kind of control, per, you know, power over the purse strings over the governor's behavior. If a governor wanted to get paid well and on time, the governor had to play ball. So there was that kind of thing. But even, even with that, I think when, when smallpox came along, things got ratcheted up. And in fact, the governor, Samuel Shute, used the threat of smallpox to uh, coerce the Massachusetts House of Representatives, which was very much opposed to him, uh, or, or tried to use it, I should say, tried to use smallpox to, to, to coerce them to cooperate with him. And he did that by forcing them into session in the most infected part of town, and basically saying, you'll leave when, I, when, when you agree to what I'm saying. And, and I'm not saying there's a direct parallel to that here, but I think you're seeing that uh, either directly or indirectly, smallpox becomes another leverage, uh, piece of political leverage. Um, and at, you know, certainly at the national level today, um, but also you know, local, local and, and state uh, governments as well. And, and obviously the whole social thing, people were very divided at that point. They were pro-inoculation, anti-inoculation. And that really became, that became sort of a, uh, a holder, if you will, for other, bi other, not biases, but other disagreements that already existed. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, later on, much later on, inoculation, pre-revolution, inoculation was associated very heavily with uh, British sympathizers because it tended to be the people who had more money who tended to be British sympathizers, who could afford inoculation. So there's a lot of a lot of uh, resentment against inoculation was less about the medical aspect than sort of that kind of political uh, baggage that it came with, and and that's actually something that you know the people who still propo uh, were proponents of it, including Washington, had to had to contend with that that sense that it was part of the British British deal. So yeah, I mean, it's not like it's not completely divorced from the the uh, medical aspect of the story. But the reason I called it the fever of 1721 and not the epidemic of 1721 is that I did really feel that this was a story of what happens to a society under stress. And certainly we're seeing now that the society under stress um, reacts in ways that can be very good and also very bad. Absolutely. Well, Stephen, thank you so much. The author, Stephen Koss, the book, The Fever of 1721, The Epidemic That Revolutionized Medicine and American Politics. And thank you, my colleague, uh, Christian Despigna, for joining us. Once again, it's been an enlightening discussion. Stephen, we really appreciate your time and uh, your book. We certainly uh, hope that people go out and buy it and read it. It's certainly a timely book to have during the current circumstances. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Yep. Yep.